It's good to be in God's house, amen. It is, it is it's such, a, such a blessing uh, that we get to come and be a part of what God is doing in His kingdom. And uh, just to see, just to, just to know that, you know, this is, this is the most uh, powerful thing, uh, the most awesome uh, thing that you and I could ever be a part of. And, uh, you know, He qualifies us for it. It's, it's not us, but it's Him that qualifies us for it. Um, you and I don't have the right, we don't have the ability, we don't have the know-how, but Jesus does. And, and He says that, that we are His, and He gives us that right to come into His presence. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, we're going to begin here um, this morning. You know, I'm so I'm always so humbled and and moved by what God is doing. Um, as I said, who are we? Who am I? I, I I've often asked, you know, it, even and and not doubting God, but knowing who I am. Uh, I've often said, you know what, God, without you, I mean, where would I be? Where would any of us be this morning if it wasn't for Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus Christ, he's, he's not what, what most of us depict. I was listening to a, to a minister this morning on a different radio station, and he was talking about Jesus Christ and, and describing him in, in, in such a different way than, than we sometimes portray or see him because he was ultimately the perfect specimen of a human being because he had to be the perfect spotless lamb of God. And he was, and, and he, so he just began to describe him in, in, in what he was spiritually and physically and mentally in all of his faculties. And, and here he's, and, and, and I was just kind of sitting there because a lot of times the depiction that we get when we see Jesus on the cross, you know, you, we've seen the, what man has, has drawn him up to be. And sometimes he's this feeble heap of bones that, that really is just, you know, uh, on the cross and, and it's just like you know if, if he'd die almost of starvation uh, and and you know and then and then other times we see him and he's he's just this limpristic uh, kind of fluffy hair walk around but he but he didn't describe him like that in any sense of the word he said he was he was actually probably the most masculine ma- man you would have ever met I mean, you're talking about a mountain of a man in the sense that everything, every part of, of him was in place. And he was, he was this strong individual outwardly, inwardly, and, and then on top of that, I mean, you talk about the whole package, and, and not, we're not talking about, you know, we know that what the Bible says, that there was no comeliness, no beauty that would draw us necessarily to him. But, but you talk about a well-rounded uh, person with an intellect unlike any who has ever walked the face of the earth. And it's just, that's the Jesus we serve. That's the God that, that they followed back then. That's the same God that we serve today. He's a perfect God. There is nothing missing in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to kind of get that picture in your head this morning as we get into the scripture. And if you'd stand for the reading of God's word, we'll begin right there in Matthew chapter 21. And I'm going to read a few verses this morning. I'm going to read out of the Amplified. It says, and when they came near, starting in verse 1, when they came near to Jerusalem, they had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus sent two disciples on ahead, saying to them, Go unto the village that is opposite you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall reply, The Lord needs them, and he will let them go without delay. This happened that that was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled saying say to the daughter of Zion inhabitants of Jerusalem behold your king is coming to you lowly and riding on a donkey and on a colt and the foal of a donkey a beast of burden 
Then the disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats upon them. And he seated himself on them, uh, seated seated, uh, himself on them, the clothing. And most of the crowd kept spreading their garments on the road and others kept cutting branches from the trees and scattering them on the road. And the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him kept shouting, Hosanna! And, and oh, propitious, graciously inclined to the Son of David, the Messiah, blessed, praised, glorified, is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Oh, be favorably disposed in the, in the highest heaven. And when he entered Jerusalem, all the city became agitated and trembling with excitement and said, Who is this? And the crowds replied, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Father, we thank you today. And we praise you. And Father, I pray that God, that we would would come in, in line with who you are today. And that, God, that we would truly place you high and lift it up. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed. I pray that, God, that today, Father, we would would truly, Father, desire more of you. And more of you in our lives. Not just today, but this would just be a beginning, Father, a moving forward of a lifetime of your leading. We thank you and we bless your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We celebrate this day and, and, you know, of course, in in history, it's it's known to believers everywhere as as Palm Sunday. It's it's the week before Jesus is is getting ready uh, for the the ultimate sacrifice. And the, the, the final uh, finishing work that he had come to do. And I, I don't know, but, I, you know, Jesus knew all of these things, all the things that were going to be taking place. And on Friday, we'll get to, to talk about that a little bit. And, and one of the reasons that we do Good Friday is because we are going to be at the park on Sunday. And Sunday will be a celebration Friday will be a remembering of what Jesus did in the agony that he had faced for you and me. But but Jesus already knew ahead of time what he was going to face in a week's time. Now, I, 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 I sometimes, I try to consider this if I knew what kind of end I was, I was about to come into, if I knew exactly like Jesus knew, all that was about to be done to him in a week's time, could I have held myself the way that Jesus did? You see, the only reason uh, we can hold ourselves is because we don't know what tomorrow brings. We don't know what's coming next. You and I have no guarantee that even today we, we will breathe our last we, we like to think that we are somehow kings and queens of our own lives and we get to direct them. But I can tell you this, there are some things that are out of our control. And, and it won't take very much to realize that. But here, Jesus Christ coming into the city, he knows what's ahead of him. He knows what, what the same crowd that is right now shouting before him, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You know, praise and, and, and giving him the highest honor. He knows what's about to befall him in a week. And he knows that many of the same crowd will be saying in just a, a few days, crucify him. And yet he's able to keep his composure. And, and, and here he is, as he's coming in, this wasn't a place that was foreign to him. He had, he had ridden down this road or walked down this road many times. 
This was actually the first time in Scripture that, that we see him riding on anything. And so, so he had been down this road many times. And, 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 and you know, it's a description even, even of our lives that, that how many of us have been down, uh, been, been down the same road many times? How many of, our, uh, of us would say our lives sometimes seem to be a repeat of days gone by? And, and some of us get into this cycle to where we get up, we go through our routine, we, we almost can predict what's going to happen. Some of you even sitting in this place today already know what you, what, what you have on the plate for tomorrow and for the next day. You, some of you, and I, and I think of this because my wife was a teacher for many, many years and, and she would already know because she had lesson plans and she would already know and sometimes even, even before the week was over, she, was already, she already had planned what she was going to be teaching next week and, and, and the week after. And, and so some of you even today are thinking about tomorrow and all of the things because your life has become so familiar. And see, this was, the, it, it, but, but it's in the middle of these moments and these times where everything seems so familiar, where everything can change. And some of you know what I mean. Because in our lives, our roles are constantly changing. I can tell you, I, I, I go back to Florida where I was born and raised. And I walk into that same house that I lived in all of my, my life as a, as, a, as a young man, as a child, and growing up into a young man. And I go in there, and it's familiar, but it's different. And oh, what a day can bring. And many of us have been down those ro that road where, where, where our journeys, um, even though the, the place where we're, we're at is familiar, our journey is unique. See, Jesus was on a mission. He had his eyes and his mind was set. He had been given orders, and, and this is something, and I love it because, you know, I, I say Wednesdays and Sundays, but it's all, we're all teaching, we're always teaching the word of God, and one just gels with the other, but Jesus was on a mission, and here he was on his father's mission, because Jesus said, I have no thought of my own. I only do those things that I see my father do. And I only speak the words that I hear my father say. So Jesus was on a mission. He had his mind set. Can I tell you, some of us, we plan our lives. And, and we, we have an idea of how it's going to look. And how it's going to turn out. And you know, we're, we're, we're young men, we're young women, and, and so here in our minds we think, oh, you know, one day I, I plan on owning a, a nice home, and, and I plan on being, getting married and, and having three kids, and, and we, we, we plan all of these things out, but how many of us know that have been down the road just a little further know that, that it rarely turns out like we plan? Even some of the best planning, it, it rarely turns out the way we plan. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't plan. We should plan. For as the old saying goes, a man who fails to plan, plans to fail. But here's the thing. He was on a mission and his mind was made up. And in spite of how it looked, he was determined to finish. Things are not always what they seem. You see, he knew this and he understood this. Things are not always what they seem because even on this day, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit, he, he gets to the end of the road and he weeps because things are not always what they seem. And, and in our time and the day that we live, uh, we understand this, I think, even, even at a greater level because, because how many of us know that, that and let me just bring in social media, things are not always what they seem, right? Because how many times do you have to take, have to take the same picture or the same pose before you post it? Because it has to be perfect, 
And if it's not, you're not going to post it because things aren't always what they seem, right? And, and let me just give you a little bit of insight, and, and I don't mean to, but, but uh, especially those people who pay attention to detail, right? And, and, and my wife is one of those. And, and I'm just like, just take the picture. And she's kind of doing this number. And I'm like, what are you looking at? She's like, the background. <laughs> and so if there's something on the counter, move it over. If there's something here, just, wh- why? Because things are not always what they seem. And, and so uh, the deception becomes in our day and age that, that everything is perfect. And why do we find people that are so depressed, even though they seem to have the perfect life on Facebook? Because they're looking at somebody else's fake life on Facebook, and it's not meeting up to what what that life is. And, and, And even though they look good on Facebook, they know that something in the background is off. Because things aren't always what they seem. This was a perfect picture. Here, Jesus is riding on a donkey into this place. And, I, and I'm probably going to mix all this in up today. <laughs> but, he, but he's riding in, and, and here's a scene of, of elated worship and a time of celebration. But things don't always appear. Things are not always as as they appear or as they seem. See, Jesus had been on this road many times. And he comes and he offers himself as as a king. In verse five, it says, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey. Now, you see, you have to take it from the perspective of those that are the, the onlookers. Because they expected their king, their messiah, their Hosanna to come. But they expected him to come and overthrow Rome. They expected him to do things physically. And yet Jesus, he, he begins to set things in order, but he begins to set them in order spiritually. First and foremost. Because he says, you know, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And so he goes through the law and and he says, this is how you perceived it and this is how you interpreted it. But let me tell you how it was really meant to be because you looked at uh, at it on an external level, but I'm telling you it's on a deeper level. It's an inward thing. And see, in the religious, they were all about the outward appearance and they were all about the physical manner. And Jesus says, you know, and, and of course in Matthew chapter 5, he just dispels their, their understanding. You have heard it said, but I say to you. you it said, he said, you heard it said, you shall not kill. But I say to you, if you're angry at your brother, it's an inward thing. You've already committed murder. You see, because you could be on the outside looking like you love your brother... But inside, you're a murderer, even if you're holding your brother with a fake smile. So things aren't always as they appear. See, we may know our road. We may think we do. But Jesus knows every step of the way. He knows the journey. He knows where you are today. But can I just say this? He knows where you're headed and where you're going. You see, you, may, you, you and I may stand up here or, or sit there and, 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 and make everyone perceive that we're on one path, but Jesus knows exactly where we are. You may appear to other people to have it all together, but, but Jesus knows that you're absolutely falling apart in, inwardly. 
We, we may appear, but Jesus knows. And he knows everything. He knows right where you're at. And he knows where you're headed. He knows where you're going today. He knows where you're going to end up in a year. He knows where you're going to be in five years and ten years. See, this is such a beautiful thing that when I begin to understand that Jesus knows my tomorrows, he knows my every day, what, what, what my job is, is to know what he knows. So, so I don't know, but he does. And so I've got to stick as closely to him as I can. But see, Jesus knew what was coming, even in his own life. But he knew he had to be faithful to the end. You see, it's not always, as, we've, as you've heard many, many times, how you start the race. But what matters Come on, somebody. What matters? How you finish. You see, all of us start off with good intentions. That's the, that's the parable of the sower. All of us start off with good intentions. All of us want to be everything. Even those that, that began to, to veer off to the left and to the right. Even Paul said all, all of Asia has heard the gospel. It wasn't very long after that. He says, all of Asia has forsaken me. They started off on the right foot. Demas, all of them, everybody seems to have forsaken me. But Paul had remained faithful. You see, it's not how we start, but it's how we finish. And are we in it for the long haul? It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. It doesn't even mean that it's going to be pretty. It just means that, that, but Jesus said, I know your tomorrows and I'll be with you and I'll help you through every situation. I'll be there through every problem. I can tell you this, Jesus knew what was ahead of him. He knew the, that, that what would, we would look upon as a tragedy. He knew what was going to come in, in a few days, and he, but he also knew what was going to happen after all of that took place, what we are going to celebrate next Sunday on that resurrection day. He knew, and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the death, even the death on the cross, despising its shame. He was willing to be humiliated. He was willing to undergo all of these things because he knew. So why? Why, why would he come? Let me just kind of go through it because I, don't, I know we have baptisms in just a little bit, but why, why a donkey? Why, why come on a, on, on a colt or a, foal, or a foal of a donkey? In one, uh, in, in one definition, the, a colt is actually a young horse who's, who has yet to be castrated. He's, he's under four years old and and he's, he's just not predictable. He's, he's wild in, in some sense of the word. And why would you come, and first of all, and because he, he sends for a colt in, in, in the foal of a donkey. So, so why would you have a colt? Why would you have this untamed thing? Why, why would you have this unpredictable beast helping you? I, 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 let, me, let me say this. How many of us are maybe untamed and unpredictable? How many of us are untamed and unpredictable? But here he is, he is showing his authority that he has the ability to bring under control anyone. Remember the tongue? It's the one that, that, that's hard to tame. We bless and we curse with it. We have the authority in the tongue to raise up, but to, to, to tear down. This is why the Bible says those that, are, those that are meek, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. If you see your brother or sister overtaken in a sin, a fault, you that are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of meekness. And we're going to get there in just a little bit because that meekness means that you have power at that moment because they are vulnerable to tear them down and destroy them or to build them up. And it's all in your tongue. And here he shows he has the power even over 
over those things that seem to be out of control. How many of us would say that there might be some things in our lives, and I don't need to raise a uh, show of hands, but how many of us would say that there are some things in our lives that are out of control? Maybe your marriage is out of control. Maybe your, maybe your job situation is out of control. Maybe your kids are out of control. Maybe something in your life is coming unraveled as we speak, and here Jesus presents himself as the one to bring all things under his control. But he comes also riding on a beast of burden, a donkey. And here it is that it's not a royal recognition. Now, now the fall uh, uh, is, is, is a beast that is not even a year old. Never had a burden laid on it. Again, another animal that is untrained. But see, here's the thing. When a king would ride in and it, it, on, a, on a horse, it was a royal entrance. He was, he was coming to establish his kingship. He was coming to, to let everyone know that he was here to rule. Many times throughout the cities, no one rode on horses except the king, the king and his army. And those that, that were part of the king's palace. Nobody, most people walked when they came into the city. But here Jesus comes and he's riding on a colt. Why? Because he didn't come for war. He didn't come but to to bring peace and to show them that, that, hey, at this time I'm coming. Now the Bible tells us of a future uh, event where Jesus will ultimately come, but he will come on a white stallion. And now when the king comes in on a white stallion, that means that he has come with absolute authority and and he will take ultimate rule over all things. And one day he's going to be leading the charge and I hope to at least be second or third in line. (laughs) At least somewhere in that crowd. But here Jesus... This is the only time that he ever rode. And, and so it was, it was a form of unique recognition for him. He was making a statement here. He, was, he, he knew that his time was up, but he was, he was making a statement. For all of those that, that had still doubted, for all of those who were still spectators, for all of those who had wondered if their Messiah had come, he was making a statement here. You see, because there were still some of those that were on the sideline, not really sure uh, if Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, I know many people say, well, he never claimed to be. Yes, he did. Ultimately, all over, he did. But, but here he's making the statement publicly, this is who I am. Some of the people got it, and they began to give him such recognition. He came also to fulfill a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt and the foal of a donkey. And see, he was fulfilling prophecy, proving to them, this is a fulfillment of scripture. I am your king. I am the Messiah. I have come. This is my appearing. It was not to be mistaken. He was was showing himself. So for all of those that are doubters, he was fulfilling a prophecy that this is who I am. Just in case you had any questions, just in case I wasn't clear enough before, I am the Messiah, he was saying. There should be no further doubt in your mind. And so he he was letting them know But along the way, we plan our journeys, but we don't know exactly how they're going to turn out. You know, we, we, we sometimes, I want to follow Christ, we have these questions, but we put that, but, I want to follow Jesus, but, I want to follow Jesus, but I, I've got other things to do. Uh, I want to follow Jesus like the, the rich young ruler but he had many, many riches and his, and his wealth was great so he 
couldn't follow Jesus. Jesus tells of another parable of when he invited them to the wedding feast. Well, I want to go, but I just got married. I want to go, but I've got some things to take care of. And we want to go, but, and that but really means that we're just really not sure here that you are who you say you are and that you are going to meet our every need. Because I can guarantee you, if there was no doubt in our mind, we would not even question his authority. If there was no doubt in our mind who Jesus was and who Jesus is, we would follow without question. Why? Because God will always meet the need. You see, that's where that little but comes in. I would follow, but I have a need, and I'm not sure that he's going to meet the need. Uh, and some people, I, I would follow, but I'm not done living my life yet. Well, I, I hope it works out for you. Because you don't know how much longer you've got to live. But Peter and John, the Bible tells us they were sent to get the donkey in verse 3. Because... The Bible says, first of all, that the Lord has need of him. I have a need, Jesus is saying. But see, here's the thing. Jesus was ultimately following his father's plan. And he knew that no matter where he was in the plan of his father, the need would be met. And that if a need arise, arose wherever he was and whatever the need was, the father was going to meet it. And so it wasn't even a question in Jesus' mind. I have a need. What do you have need of? I need a donkey. The father supplied one. Go into the city. There will be two of them, two things tied up. You just go and, and you, you untie them. That's called, that's called the horse thief. <laughs> but but Jesus said, Jesus said if, if they ask you, just tell them the Lord has need of them and they will release them. Why? I want you to think about this. Because God has already prepared the heart of that person that owns them. And he will release them to me. Because I am on a mission and I'm following the plan of my father. You see, we, we, we get messed up when we try to do our own thing and, and plan our own way. Because there's a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end it leads to destruction. And how many of us have planned our ways and, and it hasn't worked out like we planned? And how many of us have found ourselves in need and there's nothing there to supply the need? I, I, I would dare say then you might need to get on your knees and begin to pray and ask if you are in the will of your Father which is in heaven because if you were, every need will be met. Not much else to say, is there? You see a colt tied, he says in verse 2, on which no, no one is set. We have to submit to the Lord's authority. Jesus needed something to, to, to be seated on. They brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their garments on him, the Bible tells us in, in Mark 11 and 7. They threw their, their garments on him. Every need is met. Everything that Jesus had need of was, was met. I, you know, Jesus said he's no respecter of persons. He said that, that every need, every one of our needs would be met. You know, I, I, met, I meet people all down the line. Well, I, 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 I can't pay my tithes. Why can't you pay your tithes? Because I have needs. And if I pay my tithes, my needs won't be met. No, then you don't believe the Father. You don't believe the Word of God. He says, I will meet your every need. He said, you bring that tenth into the storehouse where it belongs. He says, because I own 100% of it, I'm going to let you keep 90% of it. You bring it in and I'll cause that 90% to go further than that 10% with that 10% would have ever gone. The reason people don't pay their tithes is because they don't trust him and they don't believe that he is who he says he is and as we as we said so many times that they that come to him must believe that he is that he's what 
That he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Here's the thing. He's a rewarder. But, but pastor, I, I'm, I'm so righteous and holy, and some of you already know where I'm going with this because you were here Wednesday. I don't do it for a reward. I do. I was wired that way. Here's, here, you, you know the reason why? Because like I said on Wednesday, I wouldn't give my 10% if this word wasn't true. I'd, I'd rather keep it. But I can tell you this, for 25 years, I've been giving 10%, and I've never seen the righteous forsaken, and I've never been begging for bread. He's met my every need. He's kept me here my health, my family, my children. What more could I ask for? Because his promises are true. They that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder, meaning he will take care of your needs. You know, you know it's, it's, it's a foolish, and, and let me just kind of, it's a foolish woman who would marry a man who couldn't take care of her needs. Jesus, he's, he's, the, he's the groom. And if we're the bride of Christ, that means that he's going to take care of my needs. I don't have to worry about what's coming next. There's no surprises with me. When, when I come up against something, if I'm walking in his will and, and, and I'm a part of him, then he's going to meet my needs spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally. In every way, Jesus Christ will meet my need. Now, I'm not saying your husband's going to meet all of your needs. Only Jesus can do that. But the Bible says if a man can't provide for his own household, he's worse than an infidel. And he shouldn't eat. Hello. We'd have a lot of skinny people. God help me. Let's move on. <laughs> now, depending on where you are in your relationship with Jesus Christ and where you are in, in relation to where he is, we all have different uh, perspectives of who he is. The closer we become and the closer we get, the more intimate it is and the more trust is built. So, so along the road that Jesus was traveling, there were, there were, there were many different responses in his, you know, on the journey. First of all, in, in Matthew 21 and 8, the Bible says that they spread their garments on the road. There, was a, there, there were those who were willing to sacrifice the Bible tells us, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why do you do that? Because you know what he's done for you, so it's the least that we can do for him. We realize that, why? Because of relationship to him and where we are with him. For some of them, they were, there was just a, a recognition. So, they, so, so it says in John 12 and 13, in John 12, 13, it says they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And in Matthew 21 and 11, it says, and when he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. This, this is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth. So, so, so there was this recognition of who he was. This is Jesus the prophet of Nazareth. See, see they weren't as close as, as, as those who were, were, were even more so there to, to, to come closer or draw closer to him. But they had an understanding of who he was. And so they wanted to honor him because they, it, was, it was a time of recognition. Uh, there are the, still those, and, and I believe that these are, are, are probably the most intimate. And, and it, it, is, it is those that worshipped him. In Matthew 21 and 9, it says, Those who followed cried out, Hosanna! Hosanna! 
Just as we sung this, this morning, they knew who he was. They were worshiping the Messiah. They, they, they were giving him, they were extolling him. They were, they were praising him. They were just glorifying his name. They were, they were lifting him up with their, with their voice, but with their soul and their spirit. And what a time of celebration. See, it's all in where are you? Where are you in relation to him? You see, there's, there's, there's the difference between Mary and Martha. Where Mary came to serve and she came to, to, to wash the feet of Jesus, Lazarus' sisters. And she came to wash the feet of Jesus. And, and Martha said, hey, hey, what are you doing? Don't you know that there's food that needs to be made? Don't you know that there's preparation that needs to be made? And, and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, Martha. Settle down. There's always time for that. But the most important is Worship. You see, because there were those that were there to serve him. And let me say this also, that there is a time for service. But you cannot have perfect service without perfect worship. But there were there's those that were there to serve him. Luke 19, 19 and 30. He sent two of his disciples. Go loose him and bring him here. You see, I, I believe it was the same ones, the disciples that were serving him at that moment. There was a time to serve, but it was the same disciples that were worshiping him when the time was right. You see, you see there's, the, uh, I, and, and I'd, there's a lot of times where people, they just want to, you know, oh, it's just all about, you know, I'm, I'm just always going to be. No, there's a time for everything. And sometimes you're going to have to work. And other times you can worship him. But then there were those. How could it be? But there's always those in the crowd that were rejecting him. They had an idea but, but, but their, their, their whole world was falling apart. If he is who he says he is, then, then that means that we can't be who we say we are. So they rejected him, and these were the Pharisees. In Luke 19 and 39, and the Pharisees said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why? Because the same disciples were worshiping him. Rebuke them. Stop them. You're not the Messiah. Let them know that you're not this. Please let them know, because if you are, then I've been wrong all my life. And some people, I, I believe that do, they do that even in their own lives. You see, I don't want to come to Jesus Christ. Why? Because if, if I come to Jesus Christ and I acknowledge who he is, then I have to stop being who I am, proud and arrogant and always in control. Mm. you've made a good place for you. I bet you you're enjoying your life, just like those Pharisees. If you're always in control of your life and you're proud and always trying to outdo someone, I can tell you this. It's like old Tozer said. He said, for the, for the man who's learned, he will find someone who is more scholarly. For the one who has traveled, he says he will find yet someone, a Ponce de Leon or someone else that is more traveled than he. And, and, and for those who are wealthy, you will always find someone who is more wealthy than yourself. And so we reject Jesus on the basis that if I, if I acknowledge who he is and if he is truly who he says he is, then I've got to surrender. And I've never been in a place of submission. Can I tell you this? Only those who are submitted have the right to rule. Jesus says, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, 
he will raise you up. That's what the word of God tells us. It, 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 only, only the ruled can rule. Only if you allow the spirit of God to control you can you be in a place, a position of authority and power. Jesus said, I do only those things that I see my father do. Meaning, I have come under his control and under his rule. And because I am under the rule of my father, I have all authority and all power over all demons and all devils. And nothing shall by any means harm you. Because I'm under his authority, I have authority. You see, it was so evident in the disciples. This was just common sense. Don't you remember the seven sons of Sceva? They came to the devil-possessed man and wanted to cast out seven demons. The Bible says that they came in and, and, and are the men that was demon-possessed, the seven sons, they came in and they said, in the name of Jesus, Paul's God. They weren't submitted under Jesus Christ. They weren't submitted unto God, so they didn't have authority to use the name of Jesus. And he said, Paul, I know why, because Paul is surrendered and submitted under his authority, and therefore he has the same authority that Jesus has because he's surrendered under his authority. Rejection is a hard place to be. Then there are those who are blinded. In John chapter 12 and verse 16, his disciples did not understand at first, the Bible tells us. And, and I can guarantee you that there were those in the crowd that day that did not have a clue of what was going on. How many times have you come across something and maybe you weren't paying attention and it's happened to me? You know, coming driving through the city and all of a sudden roads are blocked off and everything else and, and then it's like, what's going on here? Right? It's like, what, what in the world's happening here? Oh, they're having a parade. Oh, I didn't... Clueless. Blind, blind. Just not even paying attention. Just blinded to what's happening around us. I'm not going to go get into too much more Someone wants to come and I'm going to close. The thing is, is Jesus knew what would happen in the journey. He stops to weep, the Bible says. Luke 19, 41 through 44, and I'm not going to read it all, but the Bible says he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known. If you had known... If you had known, the days will come. Your enemies will surround you and level you and your children. You will not leave one, they will not leave one stone upon another. You see, Jesus knew what was coming ahead, what was, what was, what was coming in the future. And I can tell you this, you may think that you know, but Jesus knows what's going to take place in your life. Why? Because he knows where your heart is this morning. Ultimately, the way that you're headed, and you say, well, and, and here it is. You can't judge me. I'm not judging anyone. But I do have the right to speak the truth. You know, it's, it's the same thing as saying, you know, to any one of us you know what if you if you go down to that bank and you pull out a gun you're going to end up in prison common sense right don't do it well you can't judge me <laughs> I'm not judging you I'm just telling you the truth you'll either end up dead or in prison It's not a matter of judging. Jesus knows the future. And I can tell you this, if you do A and B, you'll end up in C. And the, the reason a lot of people say that is because they already know. 
They just don't want somebody to confirm what they already know. Because if you don't know Jesus Christ, there's this longing inside of you that can never be filled but by Jesus Christ himself. There's this part of you that is, that is longing for something greater than yourself. And you've tried to fill it with many things. You've tried to fill it with drugs. You've tried to fill it with pornography. You've tried to fill it with relationships. You've tried to fill it with money. You've tried to fill it with every single thing. But it's just a, 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 this gargantuous opening inside of your soul that you, you throw anything in and it just falls and plummets to nothing. And the only thing that, the only one that can fill that is Jesus Christ. You've searched for happiness. You've searched for joy. You've searched for peace. you searched for all of these things. And Jesus says, I am the way. I'm the truth. And I'm the life. You see, Jesus knew that in order to, to become all of that, he had to endure the week that was ahead of him because of the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? That on the other side of the cross, you and I would have the right to come to know him and to spend eternity with him. He was willing to suffer so that you wouldn't have to. I'm not saying that you're not going to have troubles in this life. The Bible says all who will live godly in this life will, will suffer persecution. But, but, but I want you to think about it just for a moment. Is what is this life? If you live, if you live a, a mere hundred years, what is this life compared to eternity? You see, because, because no matter how well you eat, no matter how much you exercise, now that's all good. Paul said bodily exercise does well, does the body good, but it profits little. Why? Because no matter how much you and I do, even if we live out a, 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 to a good old age of 103, no matter how much you work out, things are going to start to go south. Just the way it's going to be. No matter how much money you make, you can't take it with you. But the life that is to come is eternal. It's eternal. And Jesus knew this. And so he, he, he weeps, not merely because the city's going to be destroyed, but he weeps because had they known the time of their visitation, everything could change. And here's the thing, Jesus is here among you and me today. And where do we stand in the crowd? Do we stand to acknowledge him and to worship him and to say, you know what, Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, I'm here, I surrender. You say, well, well I, I've, I've, I'm a self-made person. I've done everything myself my whole life, and I am where I am today because, because I've worked hard and everything. Well, well, I can tell you this. It just takes a moment in time, a moment in life, and everything can change. And really, you think you did it all on your own. But who controls the breath that's in your lungs but him who gave it? And the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And you and I, that's a judgment that you and I can't escape. That's a court date that you and I will not be able to get out of. But I can tell you this, I want him there as my attorney, not my prosecutor, not, not the prosecutor. I don't want him there as, as my judge. I want him there as my advocate. I want him there fighting my case. That when, that when the law has been laid down and all of the accusations that are true, when the accuser of the brethren comes against me and I stand in that room that day, that courtroom that day, and that accuser of the brethren steps forth and he says about me, he says, he was, he, he, he's a sinner. Don't you know all of the things that he's done in his, in his life? He used, to, he, he used to do drugs. He did all of this garbage. And he calls up every single account against my life. 
everything true. Why? Because he's the accuser of the brethren. And he says, he has no right, no right to enter into your kingdom, that righteous and holy kingdom. Satan's trying to keep everybody out of there because he was there once. He knows how awesome it is, how wonderful it is. And he doesn't want anybody to go there. And he's going to bring up everything that I've ever done, every thought. The Bible says every single word that has ever rolled off of this tongue and the intention behind it. And every, every bit will be true against me. But at that moment, I don't want to stand there without Jesus Christ. I want Jesus to be able to step in front and say, he's mine. He's mine. I paid for him. I bought him with the blood. He's free. Welcome into the joys of the Lord. I'm not a self-made man. I crumble at my knees and I surrender to the King of Kings because without him, I am nothing. And apart from him, I'll never be anything. But in Jesus Christ, I'm everything he says that I am.